as we hurtle headlong into the digital age, pause to ponder just how far we've come. The 80s generation had no dot com, no digital. The future they imagined has been transformed by a technology revolution. My, how we've changed. Welcome to a short history of the modern world, charting the good and bad of a quarter century of innovation. This is Stop Rewind. The next half hour of power is all about energy. Over the past quarter century, it's been generated by everything from gas, grass, atoms, and chicken duty. All kinds of energy supplies have been tried and tested, but this whole quest for cheap, clean power isn't some tree-hugging trip. It was kicked off by the 1973 oil crisis, when Arab nations tightened the export of oil to some countries in the West. You see, it seems they weren't happy with America backing Israel against them in the recent Yom Kippur War. So it was time to find an energy source that wasn't a political nightmare. Back then, nuclear looked good. No smog and no Mideast supply issues. Then, a little mishap at Three Mile Island nuclear plant threw the brakes on that. Nobody was killed. But that didn't matter. Few Americans wanted to risk a nuked out neighbourhood. So, getting a jump start on energy was going to take some different thinking. Here in Osage, Iowa, the local residents faced a bill for a new $10 million power station. Lots of options on that one. Solar, nuclear, oil, hydro. Their choice? None of the above. They just decided to use less power and more common sense, insulating their homes, using energy-saving light bulbs and doing energy audits. A lot of which became the norm. Everything that we've done is simple, very, very simple. And uh, this is what amazes most people when they look at our projects and look at our programs and say, we can do this too because everything you've done is simple. Osage was able to reduce its energy usage by one-sixth, but they still weren't energy self-sufficient and that's frustrating. Because everywhere you look, nature's turning up the juice, from solar rays to surging tides and gusting winds. Over in Wyoming, they were trying to tap into nature's power grid with one of the earliest attempts at wind energy on an industrial scale. These things were massive. The blades were the width of a football field and they worked. This one turbine made enough power for 3,000 people. But they were more expensive than coal or power stations. In 1988, when the turbines broke down, with a million dollar repair bill looming, the project got scrapped. These turbines were a small step to today's modern wind farms. In France, they had less luck turning nature's power into usable energy. This facility focused solar energy on a tower, where it heated up water which drove a turbine. This energy was 20 times the cost of nuclear or oil-produced electricity. So, by 1988, it was power down on this experiment. France had met their Waterloo, only this time it was solar. But they were yet to have their Three Mile Island, so they kept using nuclear power, which provides 78% of France's electricity. This gives them some independence from the threat of oil embargoes. Up in Norway, they were trying to turn the tide into cheap, safe power. This was an experimental wave power generator. It funneled air up this cylinder to spin a turbine and make electricity. The wind ripped through at 60 metres a second. But this was an experimental unit that kind of sucked when it came to turning wind into power.
instant facelift. Here in Nova Scotia, nature had a little trick. A 16 metre high tide. So, a tidal power station was built that let the water do the work. The sea would wash in on the high tide and fill up a dam. Then, that water would drain out on the low tide, spinning a turbine that generated power. There's not a lot of places on the planet with a 16 metre tide, so this development stayed a niche technology. Here was another bit of creative technology, a tower of power in Spain. This structure heated the air beneath the plastic sheets, which then wafted up the funnel through this tower, which spun the turbines to generate power. Not a lot of power, only 50 kilowatts. That's just enough energy to power up two homes per day. In the 80s, it looked like people just couldn't shake the easy kick of dirty, dangerous energy. It was cheap, and the industry had excellent know-how ripping it out of the ground. Like this massive North Sea oil rig. Called Statfield Charlie, this was the largest oil platform in the world at 290 metres high. Even at a cost of $1.5 billion back in 1986, this beast paid for itself in a single year because that your Charlie was pumping out $300,000 of oil a day. Now, let's compare Charlie with the alternative power station of the mid-1980s. The French solar power station created 2,500 kilowatts. Wind turbines cranked out 4,000 kilowatts. But Statfjord Charlie could pump out and store 1.3 million barrels of oil in its base, which translates into about 2 billion kilowatts of potential power. It looked like oil and nuclear had solar and wind power over a barrel. Then fate stepped in, making people think twice about cheap and or dirty power. In April 1986, there was an explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power station. It released hundreds of times more fallout than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Unlike Three Mile Island, Chernobyl caused real casualties. It looked like luck had run out for nuclear power. When you're dealing with machinery that contains and produces tremendous amounts of energy, and with human beings, there's always a possibility of error and accidents. The cleanup bill for Chernobyl has been estimated at tens of billions of dollars. At the time, Earth's most expensive disaster, and a warning to others interested in expanding their nuclear programs. It cost an immense amount of money to build it, it cost an immense amount of money to get rid of the waste it produces, an immense amount of money once it's been decommissioned to look after its dead hole. They damn well know they can't do it and make it pay. Suddenly, the expense of solar, wind and wave weren't that big a problem. So, governments got charged up to spend some serious cash researching alternative energy, especially on a thing called fusion. Only the fusion is the answer for the human beings to exist in the next century. Fusion is the natural chain reaction that happens when two hydrogen atoms fuse. It's what makes the sun shine. And while it's a reaction that happens at an atomic level, fusion gives off little radioactive energy or the associated accidents that come with it. Take Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. The fuel is cheap, as fusion uses a form of hydrogen naturally found in seawater. But the hydrogen has to be superheated for fusion to occur. We're talking over a million degrees centigrade. And right now, that takes more energy to create than the fusion process produces. In fact, scientists believe that we won't have the technology to make usable fusion energy until at least 2050. That'll be good news for the grandkids. But here is a more timely use of hydrogen fuel. 
This was, pun intended, the green car. While it looked pretty cool, back then, as is the case now, the freeways were lacking in hydrogen pumping service stations. So this green machine got the red light. It seems there were a lot of alternative energy cars in the early 90s trying to steer clear of the pollution and prices of petrol. This was General Motors' idea, the impact. Super aerodynamic and lightweight. Not to be outdone, Ford put up the practical looking electric powered Ecovan. The hybrid vehicle, which is almost identical to today's hybrid vehicles, was this Swedish creation. The LA301. Like today's hybrids, it could run on petrol or electricity. Unfortunately, it never went into mass production. Which makes you wonder. Perhaps it was a fear of not getting things right. Worst thing you can possibly do with new technology is put it in the marketplace before it's ready, and then you will sour the a customer on that technology, may never recover, never want it again if it's not right. With electric cars, you might not be burning fuel in the engine bay, but there's probably a coal, nuclear, or oil power station running so your car can be smog free. A dilemma the experts were pondering way back in 1992. Electric cars are a partial interim solution. They're not the basic solution. The basic solution is to design societies around people rather than around a transport device. But what if you could run those electric cars on sustainable power? Every once in a while, mankind taps into nature's power grid and makes some energy that doesn't dirty up the sky. Yep, we are talking hydroelectricity. And this dam on the Parana River in Brazil was the big daddy back in the 80s. Here are the stats. It cost $16 billion. It took 16 years to build, with a workforce of 40,000 creating a dam wall eight kilometers long and almost 200 meters high. And this dam created a lake behind it that went for 170 kilometers. When it came to power, this cement giant ripped out a massive 94.6 billion kilowatts. And to top it all off, it was sustainable. Not bad, but not perfect. Few other countries have a rainforest system to supply all that water. Neither can too many places afford to turn a 170 kilometer chunk of their nation into a lake. Perhaps the only eco-friendly transport is the good old push bike. And why not strap a propeller to it so you can generate energy as you ride? Well, that's what Japanese bike builder Hiroaki Okada did, and he used that excess energy to brew up a cappuccino. Which is a lot of effort to go to for a hot drink. Well, you could also ask why he struck the jet engine onto his bike. He didn't stop there, though. Using every bit of cunning and scientific genius his inner 12-year-old could muster, he invented the water-propelled push bike. Now there's a nerd with a sense of humour and some very patient friends. A more proven form of energy has been bubbling up since before the 1980s. No radioactive waste, no smog, cheap and the tourists love it. This is geothermal energy. And here in New Zealand, they use geothermal steam to drive a turbine, creating 190 megawatts. You can find geothermal energy just about anywhere there are volcanoes. 
like Iceland, where warm wastewater from this geothermal power station produced a nice little side effect. And this is the only place in the world where you go to the power station to have a swim. Hawaii also turned on to geothermal power. Geothermal is a constant source of energy. We are not dependent on the sun or the wind power, and we can have a constant source of energy to generate power. But geothermal power is a two-edged sword. You get non-polluting energy, but remember, it's found mainly in volcanic regions. Well, sooner or later, all that geothermal energy is going to have a bad day. All these problems meant that in the late 80s, the search for black gold was still on. And you can rely on the French to think a couple of miles outside the box when they go looking for oil. Not out on the high seas, not drilling in some desert oasis, but right in the heart of Paris. An oil rig in the City of Lights. But the French weren't the only ones scraping the bottom of the barrel when it came to oil. Australians were making the cheapest oil rigs they could to pump out small pockets of oil. Known as monotowers, these rigs could operate unmanned. This monotower is being installed in Bass Strait, one of the roughest seas in the world. It's no easy task, and the machinery used to install it is huge. That hook weighs 170 tonnes. The rig has to slot together perfectly, or the entire multi-million dollar setup will be smashed into the sea. It's built and ready to pump in a quarter of the time of a normal platform and at one-eighth the cost. Over in the Gulf of Mexico, things were getting just as tricky with a floating oil rig that was able to drill down almost half a mile. At the time, it was the deepest oil rig in the world. With no pylons reaching to the ocean floor, it was kept steady by these cables. And it pumped out 35,000 barrels of oil a day. Just when fossil fuels seemed cheap, efficient and family friendly, fate stepped in and reminded us that everything has a price. The oil tanker Exxon Valdez spilled around 40 million litres of crude oil in Alaska. With birds and wildlife taking the brunt of the spill, the reputation of oil was sent to hell. With necessity being the mother of invention, the accident motivated some creative technology. This was Elastol, a product made from a similar base as chewing gum. It mixed with the spilled oil to make it easier to clean up. So you probably don't want to go blowing any bubbles with this gum. Another idea to soak up the oil was staring straight at the cleanup crews. Birds. Their feathers naturally trap oil. So some Irish scientists thought they would use chicken feathers sewn into a bag to absorb the oil. And it worked, with each feather absorbing 16 times its own weight. With so many problems with gas, oil and nuclear, people were looking in some pretty weird places for ways to power up. In Norway, they were trying to work out how to get energy from the northern lights. These are made from the solar winds hitting Earth's atmosphere, and three hours of them could generate enough electricity for over two billion people every year. But 25 years down the track, and tapping that energy is still a distant vision. From one deep freeze to another, this is ice you can burn. It's known as white coal, and it's made when methane and water are combined under high pressure in cold environments, say beneath the Arctic Sea, where it can cause havoc with oil wells and clog up pipelines. In the early 90s, they were looking at artificially creating white coal. 
the tests made for some pretty cool party tricks. But the burnt methane from white coal produced greenhouse gases. And it wasn't very efficient as a fuel, so it never caught on. There were other things you could burn to create energy that at least solved some problems. In England, during the 1980s, a local council developed a program that turned household waste into burnable fuel. But bureaucratic bungling saw this idea trashed at the start of the 90s. Another concept took this and turned it into this at a poultry-powered power plant in England. It took chicken duty, dried it out, and turned it into fuel. And these feathered friends are never going to get radioactive. Though they might occasionally get a little ruffled. All these plants to burn alternative fuels still created problems. And the experts have been warning us about that far longer than we probably remember. Now those models broadly predict that in the next 30 to 50 years, uh, we will expect the equivalent of having carbon dioxide double and a warming of the planet on average of between about one and a half and four and a half degrees. And that was back in 1988. They also had some other prophecies, which came true in the form of Hurricane Katrina. Florida and other parts of the Gulf of Mexico will be facing the worst floods on record. Remember, that was back in the 80s, and now it's come to pass. It's a big reminder for scientists to develop clean energy. Nature was just a full bag of inspiration in the 90s for anyone wanting to make clean energy. In Japan, they took a cue from Flip of the Friendly Dolphin. They made a metal version, painted some eyes and a tail, and then they placed an industrial turbine on its blowhole. This added mechanical touch generated electricity from the air that rushed through it. But this whale only splashed out enough power for less than 100 homes. 2005 and another geothermal idea in the Australian desert. But with no volcanic activity around, they had to dig deep to tap into the Earth's natural heat, where water could be warmed by geothermal activity. But just like the blowhole technology, this geothermal concept was still at the prototype stage in 2010. That's the tragic lesson of this rewind review of energy technology. Despite improvements with wave, wind and solar, they all have their shortcomings. What happens when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, and the waves don't rise? So, we are still dependent on the limited resources of coal, oil, and nuclear, until the day that a magic solution like fusion comes along. However, we can still save the power we already have, just like the everyday folk of Osage, Iowa. Otherwise, it's a dark, dirty future for us all.